Yep. All right, cool. Hi. Hi. I'm Davide. And I'm Neil. Uh, we'll be talking about Fedora's I Remix and what we've been doing for the past year. Um, oh, yeah, that two clickers, that is the downside. <laughs> um, we are both humans, we both do a lot of stuff. Um, most of it not super relevant for this talk. Yeah. Um, I didn't grow another bullet point. You, the you, last you did get another bullet point on that slide, so <laughs> Neil has more bullet points than me. I know yeah. I'm missing some. I did it, like that's it. That's fine. Um, How can you do this to us? Uh, fine. Next time there'll be more. Oh, so I work at Meta. I am now wearing my Meta hoodie, so this is a Fedora talk, as you can tell by the slide template. Yeah. All right, let's talk about Asai and what's been going on and what Asai is. So Fedora Asahi is ultimately run by the Fedora Asahi SIG, which is a special interest group that maintains Apple platform software. So that includes particularly Apple Silicon platforms, but even things like the sync, co the sync libraries and stuff for iPods and iPads and whatever on Linux are all part of this. We develop and maintain uh, the variants of Fedora Media for Apple Silicon and also maintain all the Apple integration software that exists within the Fedora ecosystem. All right, and the Fedora Zai Remix is a derivative of Fedora optimized and meant to run on Apple Silicon hardware devices like that MacBook down there that you are welcome to play with if you would like. Um, it is basically Fedora and it's meant to be just like Fedora Linux uh, with the minimum amount of change is necessary to make the hardware work well. And this amounts to having a custom kernel, a custom Mesa. Um, we need a custom Mesa both because the driver is still in the process of being upstream, and also because Mesa is tightly coupled with the kernel. We need a custom U-boot, um, primarily because uh, there's a fairly large-ish patch set on top of U-boot that is in the process of getting upstreamed. Um, and then it's a remix, so it needs the remix branding and special source things. Um, Note, not special. Well, the, the, <laughs> you, you get yeah, what I mean. I know. Like, yeah, yeah. No, the the is... magical branding packages and all of that that are not super well documented. Um, yes. <laughs> we have four flavors. We have KDE, GNOME, Server, and Minimal. So Fedora Asahi Remix KDE is our flagship experience. Uh, it's a partnership between the Asahi SIG and the KDE SIG, um, along with upstream Asahi Linux contributors. So this is, if you've used the Fedora KDE spin on on x86 platforms or other ARM platforms, this is basically the same software collection, just with some slight twists to make sure that things work fine for the Apple platform. Um, so you have all the same things around the branding, Firefox, SE Linux, everything you would normally expect in a, in a Fedora KDE uh, install, you will he have here just on top of the Apple Silicon enablement work. And if you happen to prefer GNOME, GNOME is also an option, and the GNOME variant is effectively Fedora Workstation with just the layered on top, the, the hardware enablement. Uh, there's a few minor tweaks around branding and usability, but nothing um, nothing that will make it a meaningfully different experience from Fedora Workstation that you know and love. And then there's server and minimal, which are the headless variants that we have. Um, this is really because both David and I uh, started doing this stuff to do testing and other headless things with an ARM platform that didn't suck. And so these were really the first ones that came into existence for us to be able to, well, use an ARM platform in a way that it didn't suck. Yes, turns out you can buy a Mac Mini and run it 24 seven and it will not spontaneously catch fire, uh, which is not true for a lot of embedded development boards that are not designed to run 24 seven. And even some that are. All right, uh, let's talk about where we are now. So right now we have broad support for our Macs. Uh, the Remix runs on all M1 and M2 released laptops and desktops with one exception, which is the Mac Pro. Um, there is some like basic support for the Mac Pro, but the problem with the Mac Pro is one, it's a stupid machine. Uh, <laughs> that there, there is very little reason to buy and own, so and it two, has not been a priority. Um, it's a it, stupid machine with a stupid price. It, That's it, the important it, part. It also has hardware-specific quirks only in that model. Um, that make it slightly more annoying. So it just hasn't been a priority. But everything else, including the IMAX, uh, the all-in-one devices and all of that works. Um, the, from the Linux side, we treat the firmware the, and the macOS version as kind of the boundary. So the API that we interface with is the firmware that is provided by the macOS side. So right now we target 13.5, which is the version on the other side of the fence. And like the basic stuff you would expect works fine. So we have hardware accelerated graphics, we have camera, we have the silly touch bar that you can see on that laptop, um, which, 
Yeah, uh, the touch bar, by the way, is a display. So you can run Doom or whatever you want on it. Yeah, it, yeah. It, is, it is. Fun its own fact: thing. When we first enabled it, uh, it started sending the regular display graphics right into that thing. Yeah, that was fun to debug. Uh, <laughs> uh, I believe we still have an entertaining paper cut where, when you shut down the machine, if you look closely to the corner of the touch bar, it does a little thing. Yeah, because Plymouth. Yep, you can. Oh, uh, you probably can. Yeah. yeah, you absolutely can do that. It's just that Plymouth doesn't know how to handle multiple heads of different sizes, so it doesn't do anything no. special yet. Uh, we have speaker support, which we'll talk about in a minute on all models except the iMac, um, because the speaker support requires doing modeling of the, how the audio works, and the speakers in the iMac are physically different than the speakers in other devices, and we need to buy more iMacs. Um, <sighs> yeah, we and we have do. HDMI output on MacBooks with physical HDMI ports. Um, so that laptop doesn't have HDMI output because that laptop only has um, DisplayPort, USB-C port, and the DisplayPort stack is still a work in progress. But if you have a MacBook like the larger ones that have physical HDMI, those work fine. And obviously, if you have like a Mac Mini or a Mac Studio, those work fine. So basically, if you have one of the 16-inch or 14-inch MacBook Pros, they will have the port. If you have any the 13-inch or the Airs, they won't have it. Uh, on things that do not work yet. Uh, well, the microphone doesn't work. Turns out the microphone on these devices is interesting. Uh, the microphone is controlled by a custom IP block that uses a custom ISA and runs, for God knows what reason, magical firmware. Uh, all of the reverse engineering necessary to enable this has been done, but it just needs to be wired up everywhere. Um, HDMI audio support it is technically there, but it's disabled by default because there were some issues with it. It should come out, I believe, in the next few weeks, it, enabled by default. Maybe. Um, DisplayPort Thunderbolt is still work in progress. Uh, it is actively being worked on, but it's just, it's just been a while. And turns out modern USB is very complex, and getting it somewhat working is fine. Getting it working reliably so that if you unplug a massive chain of devices, Nothing implodes. Is is that's harder? Yeah. Um, it's fun seeing the whole stack crash just because you plugged something in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, for some value of fun. Um, <laughs> other other things that are specific to these devices is the secure. These devices have a secure enclave processor that could technically be used to implement a TPM, but it's not a TPM itself. Uh, this requires enablement, and it's also what will be required if we want to get secure boot running on these models. This is not done yet. Uh, we also don't have Touch ID, because Touch ID is tight. Touch ID is the thing that lets you unlock it by just using your fingerprint. Uh, that's also not implemented because it's tied to this thing. Um, so from uh, for we talked about how we don't have microphone, but we do have speakers. The way we were able to enable the speakers is that we have this really special uh, audio stack that gives you speaker protection. It, uh, it actually, like, in, it re-implements the stuff that in typical x86 laptops or other platforms, you tend to see that there's, like, magic sauce firmware thingies that, like, do the audio, post -proce the audio processing for sending it out to the speakers. Well, Macs don't have that. They have just a resistor wire going straight to the straight to the computer, uh, so you have to do it in software, and that's what this stack does for us. Um, but the upside is that you can actually choose how, and like we provide a, a very neutral, clean sounding way of doing this, but like you can change this and do whatever kind of um, audio profile that you want with your sound, and that's pretty cool, and there's a lot more details about it, and in theory you can use this to enhance the audio quality of any computer. Because none yes. of this is special. None of this is specific to Apple Silicon. It's just that on these machines, you have to do this to get decent audio quality, and you have to implement speaker protection, because if you just drive current through the speaker, you will burn it. Um, while on most laptops, there's a hardware limiter that this doesn't, doesn't let you it. do that. Um, but most laptops have unpleasant audio quality. Uh, on these laptops, we are able to use software to make the audio quality better. And there's nothing stopping people to apply the same principle to other laptops if they wanted to do so. Uh, the, in, the one thing I want to mention is the best extender, because I think that's cool. Uh, turns out uh, modern psychoacoustics allows us to do fancy things to the brain. Uh, <laughs> so that even if your laptop only has two tiny tweeters in the top that cannot reproduce bass frequencies, you perceive bass as if it were there and as if it were in the right place. Um, I do not understand how this actually works, but it does, and it's, it is cool. And again, this is something that is just a filter in the uh, speaker chain in Wire Plumber, so you could use it anywhere else. Um, we also have uh, DZ, um, Fedora Zy Remix and Azai Linux in general as the first conformant OpenGL 4.6 implementation on the platform. 
Conformant means that it conforms to the standard. Apple does not provide a standard conformant OpenGL implementation on macOS. It um, passes the CTS. Uh, our does. <laughs> Uh, this means you can run games, you can run Blender, uh, it is technically better than MacOS, uh, and you can read Alisa's blog for all the details on this. This is shipped in the, on that machine and in, in the that's what the, now. That's what it's running right now. Uh, and there is Blender on that machine too that you can play with if you know how to use Blender. Um, and all of this is running on top of the most awesome Linux desktop out there, KDE Plasma. And with KDE Plasma 6, this is the latest major version, latest stack, and full first class Wayland, both upstream and downstream in here. So Wayland is default and upstream KDE. There's a lot of little refinements across the board. It's not too different from if you've been using KDE Plasma 5 for the past 10 years, it's pretty similar. Uh, but it is essentially the best of what you, if you liked what KDE Plasma did before, this is the best of what it was before. There's more details on Fedora Magazine if you wanna look it up more. And related to all of that, this is the chain of all the things that we did over the past like four years. Some of the things <laughs> that we did. <laughs> uh, well, major changes. Yeah. We, major changes uh, over the past four years. Actually, we're missing one because the F40 change for Wayland only. Oh yeah. Uh, Wayland only Plasma is not on that list. No. But yeah, this is this this stuff was geared towards improving the Fedora KD experience for everybody, but also geared towards making the Apple Silicon platform not suck with Fedora. Yeah, and it's worth stressing this platform is Wayland only from a support standpoint. You can technically run X. Uh, it will likely not be a fantastic experience. There are known issues with X that we just cannot fix. Um, and most of the development focus is on Wayland and all of, everything we ship by default is Wayland. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, so yeah. Chromebooks and, and Apple Silicon platforms share a lot in common when it comes to their display pipeline, so they have all the same issues. We also yeah. have that um, speaker issue on a couple x86 models. Yep. There's no audio protection and firmware is terrible. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You should be able to use the same mechanics that yeah. was used there. Yeah, yeah. The, main, the main thing for, you know, just a moment about the, the, the audio tuning thing since it came up, the main thing you have to do is that you have to basically record the audio ambience from, from the speakers and be able to use it as a way of tuning what the software will send to the, to the speakers. And once that's done, you have all of this in place. I think Hector wrote up a, yeah. a, blo a, a little post about how to actually do it. Yeah, for the tuning part, yeah. And for the protection, it's, um, it's, it's basically a watchdog system where the kernel will cut the speakers off by default unless the user space keeps tickling it and telling it it's fine, it's fine, you can keep it going. And it's optimized in such a way that it doesn't affect the battery life. Well. Oh. That, that seems that's, very bad. Please, that's very, please yeah, fix that. Please yes. fix, yes. Uh, someone in the back? Yeah. yeah. One person has to do the calibration once in a decent environment with a decent microphone, and then the world can have it. Yeah. So the question was, how was it, how was it being done? Yeah. You're in a quiet room. You have a, microphone, you have a studio mic. You, you take a sample, and then you do the tuning based yeah. on that. Yeah. No, 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 no. Um, but this Yo, is, it's this only, like right? okay equipment. This doesn't need like studio level equipment to get good results. Even better. <laughs> well, you probably could. So you probably could automate it if you have a sufficiently pristine environment. Um, I think some phones do oh that for God, headphones, like but real. yeah. Um, so the question is, is there a way, no way to reverse what Apple ships? Uh, there probably is. My understanding is that the Asahi developers think what Apple did was bad, and so they did not ship that version. Uh, the, the other thing is for a variety of reasons, um, often you don't necessarily want to reverse engineer code. Um, what you want to be able to tell is, what is the machine doing when this happens? Uh, and what can we infer from this behavior to implement what we need on the Linux side? Like, th there are constraints there to make sure that the process is done in a way that is legally safe and all of that. Clean room reverse engineering requires you to not understand what the code is doing. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, so you can download these today on federalizedremix.org. If you're there, there is a um, curl pipe bash command that you can run on your Mac OS system, and we will It'll talk about the fine. installation process a bit later. 
and uh, yeah, what this does is that it will it will install the remix on your machine and then you can play with it. The first release for us was Federal Linux 39 in December of last year and we released 40 early May and I expect we release 41 probably on schedule. Yeah. Uh, uh, we're 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 doing we're a lot tighter and closer yeah. to to Fedora in terms of uh, keeping the development pace in place like we just started working on testing 610x kernels and I guess we'll soon have to do 611 because that's what's going to yeah. release in 41. Well, and, and on that website, there's also dailies. So if you want to run today's Rawhide, uh, assuming it built, because uh, it doesn't build every day. Um, yeah, sometimes it doesn't then, work. Um, yeah, I need to work on the monitoring for that. Yeah. We'll talk about the infra in a bit. Yep. Uh, oh, yeah, coming soon. Uh, we also have Vulkan in the pipe. Uh, Alisa has been working on a Vulkan implementation based on the MVK driver. Uh, this has been merged from Mesa 24.3. It has support from M1 and M2. It has fancy things like DXVK, which means you can run direct 3D games uh, if you use something like Proton. Um, this is not something you can use now today. It is Please explicitly not meant for people to use it now. It, no, needs, it needs several layers of enablement on many parts of the stack to be useful. Uh, and it's, too, it's not stable enough that uh, we can unleash it on users in a way that they would have a good experience. But it is coming, and yeah. it will get there, and there are screenshots. And you should read Alyssa's blog for details. There is examples of various things she's been able to run on it. Uh, all right, now let's talk about the fun stuff. So, What, what we're we, here for. Yeah. So the first part of this is, you know, we, we've kind of hinted a little bit about like this hardware enablement. So this is the primary reason we have this, this platform and this remix. It's, well, it turns out the Linux kernel is not quite a walk in the park. It's, oh my god. the that flickering. Okay, like so the, the Linux kernel, the biggest thing is that all the development processes for the Linux kernel and the development processes that the Asahi Linux team have are completely different and the cultures between the two have made it um, more than a little frustrating at times to get things upstream. There is still kind of work going on. It's, it's very slow, but um, you know, there's still the goal of getting things upstream, but it it has been challenging enough that we have refocused the prioritization about to ship things as they are validated and then work backwards towards getting them into mainline because um, early on we discovered that the process was just too slow to be able to make anything releasable. Yeah, the, the other thing we found early on is that this platform is different enough that often getting proper support for specific components requires major refactoring of subsystems. So for example, the power handling, the way it's implemented on the platform, right now the way we ship it is kind of a shim CPU idle driver, but if we were to do it properly, that would require some major subsystem level rework, which is doable, but that will require coordination with everybody else, and this stuff just takes time. Um, so we have been trying to prioritize between having something supportable in the future and also having something we can ship now and that people can use. And then the user space stuff was not, it was pretty painful too, actually. But the, the Chromiums, uh, this is how I get to learn how many copies of Chromium exist in the Fedora uh, <laughs> distribution because, um, because uh, Apple, uh, uh, yeah. yeah, well, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> so the, what we discovered quite early on, one of the, when we were first bringing it up, was that Plasma would crash when we, when we logged into the system. And it turns out that we use Qt Web Engine to connect to online accounts automatically in the background. And when it dies, it takes the whole thing down with it. <laughs> and so when digging into it, it was, oh, there's this whole issue of like, it's not supporting the page size, which doesn't make sense because we don't build it in a page size specific way. Nope, turns out Chromium. And so we verified this by trying to run Fedora's Chromium package and that also crashed. And it, it went all the way back up and eventually we got a fix done upstream and the big part for us um, from the Fedora side was that I had to go and backport it to all the different chromiums that we have in Fedora, which turned out to be four. Um, that was a lot of chromiums to deal with. He was, uh, he was the JavaScript interpreter, right? Uh, chromium. Yes. Yeah. So V8 gets to know what the page size is, and yeah. it actually only has it only had support for 4K. Um, one guy upstream like worked with us and made it so that it now supports 16K. 64K still doesn't work because apparently they have to rewrite the entire memory allocator for that. That's oh, <laughs> good thing we don't have to run 64K on this platform. Oh gosh, yeah, uh, but you know I worry about the yeah. Grace Hopper. 
Well, and, and it's, it's worth a tangent. Uh, so we ran 16K on this platform because that's the native page size for the platform. You can technically boot kernels built with 4K. But uh, you get no peripherals in the process. Yeah, the, the <laughs> peripherals don't work. And also, the, it's just not something we would recommend using. That's not what the hardware is designed for. That's not what MacOS runs on. That's not what Apple tests. The bridge between, to make it to be more precise here, the bridge between the core CPU and all and the the peripherals through the IOMMU, the IOMMU only works in 16K pages, and in Linux, you cannot do memory manage, uh, IOMMU in 16K and everything else in the Linux kernel in 4K like you can in macOS, yep. so this is why you can't do it. Yeah, sure, but yes. there is that too. <laughs> there is, there's a lot of reasons why we're not doing this. Yeah. But uh, this led to a whole bunch of things around Chromium, and it's fixed in Chromium 102, which incidentally yep. is also the first release where Wayland actually works properly with Chromium. Yay. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. well, 102 was like two years ago. But like, uh, I believe most Electron applications this year finally got updated to this version of Chromium. So we're good now. That's nice. <laughs> Yeah, like I said, this year. <laughs> um, so for going on from that, we also had the fun problem of the fact that pointer authentication was clearly never tested. Uh, because we turned on pointer authentication in Fedora 33, and it turns out there was no real hardware in the world when that was being done. And literally when the M2 came out, we put, booted these machines, they did not work. And it turned out GNOME especially was affected where it would crash on login. This sounds familiar. So like after experiencing this with Plasma, I was like, you know what? Let's go look at what happens with the login stack. <laughs> and no, it doesn't crash at the login stack. It actually crashes at the GNOME shell because at that point, you start having the JavaScript engines run. So Mons.js, which got fixed pretty yep. quickly. But then WebKit GTK was another one. And that was like, oh, crap. Here we go again. But it was different. In this case, it's because... Pointer authentication and BTI uh, require you for, if you have any handwritten assembler, you have to do special marking. You have to rework some parts of it and to do that. And uh, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> so yeah. I did, we just went through everywhere this happened. We turned it off. Well, on the plus side, if you happen to run um, ARM instances on AWS, the new Gravitons there also have BTI. So yes. hopefully less stuff will be broken there. Uh, yeah, I don't think everything in Fedora has been fixed because I definitely have not tested every single language runtime, and new language runtimes no, now have I, JITs in them. Yeah, I, I'm sure <laughs> basically anything with a JIT at least needs testing, probably needs work. I have not tried Ruby 3.0, and I have not tried Python 3.13, so those are probably um, going to be fun. I think Python is fine. I don't know about Ruby. Yeah. Python hasn't broken for me yet. Excellent. Okay, so Good to know. Okay. Oh, that's nice. So, so uh, Jeremy Litton over here in the audience has just said, people uh, uh, elsewhere are actually actively trying to fix this. <laughs> or he is fixing that it. That is good. <laughs> Our armed okay. people. Armed people Excellent. are fixing it. There you go. Yeah. So. All right. Um, now let's talk about the installer because the installer is fun. Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> so these machines have a, uh, what has been called a bespoke uh, boot chain. Um, the, way we, the, nice way. the way we install these machines is that uh, you run macOS, you run that very nice curl pi bash command. That command downloads a Python installer. The installer guides you through resizing your macOS partition and checking it's not corrupt. Because um, it's like in Windows, like you have to run scan disk before in case it's corrupt. And then once you have space, it lays down the OS image for the version of Fedora you want. You're missing the copy of macOS we download to put in, I, in between. Oh, no, that's right. In between, <laughs> we have to install a copy of macOS that we will use as a bootloader. After that, we lay the OS image. Then we boot your machine in a special mode where we tell you to power it down and power it on by pushing a button. That puts it in recovery mode. In recovery mode, it guides you through uh, swapping the kernel of the stub macOS install with our stage one bootloader. <laughs> So from the point of view of the firmware, it's still booting macOS, except it's not booting the macOS kernel, it's booting our stage one bootloader. Which pretends to be macOS. Which pretends to be macOS. And then from the next boot, our stage one bootloader changes the stage two bootloader, which is the same bootloader, but this way we can update it without doing this rigmarole every time. <laughs> this chain loads U-boot. Which U then chain loads Grub. Uh, well, there's a step in the middle. U-boot starts up the UEFI emulation, so right. it puts up a vaguely system-ready-esque environment. 
then you get into, then it's just normal Fedora. You just get Grub and then Linux and all, and so on and so forth. So With no working uh, EFI services, that's the important uh, part. Yes, we don't have EFI services, we don't have the variable store. Luckily, we don't need either of those. It was originally on and it br apparently broke things, so we turned yeah. it off. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we can talk about CI later, that's, that's another fun topic. Um, so initially we were just using the, the installer artifacts that Upstream produces because we just wanted to get this working. Uh, but one of the goals here is to get all of these eventually integrated and built in Fedora infrastructure using everything from Fedora as if, like getting stuck Fedora. Yeah, this is really annoying. Um, so we... Yeah, so we worked on getting, the first step was getting the stage one for the bootloader built in Fedora, and the stage one for the bootloader is written in Rust, so we had to do some finagling with the Rust packaging to make sure we were building that properly, and then we had to build the installer. Now the installer is a macOS, it's a Python application that runs on macOS. Uh, macOS happens to ship Python, but it ships kind of a not useful version of Python, shall we say. Um, so it turns out to do something useful, we have to ship our own Python. Also, because the installer has to run twice, it has to run on macOS, but it has to run in the recovery environment, we also need uh, libffi, because it turns out the recovery environment doesn't have libffi, and we happen to need that. Um, now, as you might know, you, we cannot build macOS applications in Koji. Uh, and, um, I don't that, want that, to. That, that, yeah, that would be problematic. <laughs> Uh, so we have negotiated with Fasco an exception that we are able to ship these two things as pre-built artifacts uh, that we get. We get Python from upstream Python, so it's the upstream release Python binary for, um, for MacOS. And, and we, we get libffi from Homebrew. homebrew I yeah, believe. we steal a blob from yeah. Homebrew. And then as part of the package build for Azai installer, we, we pack this up in the way they're supposed to be. We check the checksums and everything. We put them into a sub-package and then... Um, Right that. now, we just have the sub package and we start the installer from there. But long term, what I would really like to do is uh, fix uh, that Pungy. unholy amalgamation of Pungy and Welder and whatever other parts are in the system so that this gets laid down in the install tree nicely. Like alongside the Pixie Boot directory, we get an Azai installer directory and this is done there. So then I can just point the endpoint there and everybody. Oh, and, we'll also have to have a, and we also probably want a mirror manager uh, redirect link so it can use the yeah, mirror yeah, network. Like, th there's a bunch of like, niceties to do, but this is already better than what we had before, which was just shipping using the upstream ones unchanged. Uh, also, a nice side effect of this is that we can do branding. So now the stage one M1 and one has the Fedora logo. So from power button to boot, you only see the Fedora logo. You see the Apple logo for a split second and then the Fedora logo. And then the logo, not the Fedora logo. No, yeah. no, 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 not with this one. The no, because no, 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 no. with the stage one, the SI one you see is the stage one. And if we build the stage one in Fedora, the stage one has the Fedora logo. So now, as of right now, if you yep. go and get it from fedorasahiremix.org, you will get Fedora stage one, Fedora stage two. If you go from asahilinux.org and use theirs, you'll get yep. Asahi stage one, Fedora stage two. Um, and related to this, because this is starting to get a bit complicated, uh, we realized we kind of needed documentation. Uh, <laughs> so we already had user documentation and we spent a fair bit of time expanding it and like addressing common issues. But one thing I really wanted to get written down was what makes the remix different from stock Fedora? Because that was something that is useful to know and is useful to be able to point people at. And also how is this thing put together in the first place? Um, it turns out we're not the only ones that, are, that want to do these kind of things. Um, but no one else are, knows how to do it. There so. are other platforms that could benefit from hardware enablement focused remixes to help get them going and then get things integrated in Fedora. So we spend a bunch of time putting together how this works and you can read those links if you want and you can go on the doc side. Um, I will spend half a minute giving it not kicking us out yet to explain how the infra works because I think it's interesting for this audience specifically. Uh, so uh, we build the images in Kiwi, and Neil will talk about Kiwi in a minute. Uh, these images are currently built on AWS. Uh, we have an AWS, uh, that, let me walk this in my head. We have an AWS Lambda that kicks off periodically. That the starts an EC2 instance. The Lambda fires off an EC2 instance. The EC2 instance does the build. We can't do the build in Lambda because it takes too long. And then uh, we, it does the build, and then it shows the artifacts into S3. There's another Lambda that Tails, the, mm, tails some cube thing, and then when there's a signal there, it regenerates the manifest. So it, this then shows up in the things that are available to install. 
And then um, at the final step, we regenerate the website because that's, that's yes. how the list is shown. Yeah, and then there's a bunch of other like ancillary pipelines to make this work because we didn't want to deploy the lambdas by hand. So there's like fancy DevOps automation around it. But like, uh, we do this in AWS because we can't build this yet in Koji because building this requires as you ever so far components that are not part of federal infrastructure like our custom kernel, our custom mesa and so on. Uh, so baby steps. Yeah. Um, but we could build this in Koji because Koji knows how to build Kiwi images now. Yep. Uh, the, the missing step there would then be making Koji take the Kiwi image and convert it into the format that the installer needs. Which is uh, really we have to enhance Kiwi to do it automatically. Yeah, but it's basically like a zip file with a files with specific names and a little JSON. So that, that would be fairly straightforward. Um, and then it just works. Yep. And surprisingly so. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. You want to talk about Kiwi? Yeah. So like as part of doing this, we, we originally tried to do this with the Fedora imaging tools that exist. And I never wanted to bash my head more into a table than trying to get Oz to produce something. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and that was, and I already didn't want to use it, but I was like, well, we should try to make this work in a way that we can reuse this in Fedora. And then it's like, you know what? No, this is not worth it. So we went in, into trying a bunch of different tools. And one of the things that led us ultimately to using Kiwi, aside from the fact that I develop it upstream, was that it allowed us to set the custom disk geometry correctly so that we could split the, so we could create oh, the yeah. final image because it has to be 4K aligned, it has to be one, uh, one mebibyte aligned partitions with 4K aligned block sizes and all this other weird stuff that we have to do so that we can chop the image correctly to be uh, packed up for the installer bundle that we have to create. Uh, and on top of that, the, the, the declarative mechanism and being able to have the composition structure with the Kiwi profiles made it very easy for us to maintain all the different variants without having to duplicate too much between them. So Yeah, and doing local builds is easy. So oh, as, yes. as long as you have an ARM machine somewhere, whether it's your laptop or some like cloud instance, you can just do a build immediately and test it and fire it off. And that, that's been pretty handy. In the very early days before I had access to anything useful at my house to do this, um, I would use the Packager ARM64 machines to just run this, and they work fine. It was a little slow because those machines are a little constrained, but, but it was fine. Did you not oom it? Uh, I did not. That's, I managed to not oom it. It was actually nice. surprising. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so this, this is a... Oh, unit. yeah. Yeah, so as I said earlier, the idea is to eventually have this to just be Fedora. We don't want to keep maintaining the remix forever. That's not the goal here. The goal is to get everything integrated into Fedora and ideally get everything integrated so that then other distributions can integrate it. And there are, in fact, projects to get this into Ubuntu, into other distros. Uh, Ubuntu, Debian, Nix are the ones I know. I yeah. know OpenBSD is the other one I know yeah. of. Uh, but I'm sure there are more. Um, so we are, we are getting there. I think right now, um, as I mentioned, there is that page that shows exactly what the delta is, but it primarily amounts to the kernel, U-boot, Mesa, and then as a side effect of that, the like build and release ancillary stuff. But we will get there eventually. Um, I think we are already at the point where you could use a, uh, like a stock Fedora kernel without our patches and boot a baseline Mac mini and it, it will boot and not die. It won't be so terribly useful. I don't uh, think the peripherals would work. It should. Yeah, but at least it's like you could use it for CI purposes and stuff, for example. I don't know how you log in um, without, without, but, without a keyboard. Though. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not <laughs> ideal. But like eventually we will get there. Uh, question? Oh, so they're not out of tree kernel modules. This is a whole out of tree patch set. So it's applied to the kernel tree and they exist integrated into the kernel stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah these, so aren't, these aren't vendor modules. The idea is we have, a, we have a tree that is meant to be sent to Linus at any point in time and is kept up to date. No. I mean, ideally we don't, uh, but then like <laughs> stuff breaks, but, um, but no, generally speaking, having worked with like settings where you have to deal with vendor out of three modules, this is a much more pleasant. So. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's 1,200 patches of craziness, but like, there you go. Steven. Yeah. Yeah. Other. Yeah. I was going to say, is it ever going to be possible to entirely have everything upstream? Because it sounds like the other part is just the bespoke boot. So the, the boot part is the easy part, actually. Yeah, the, the boot part is mostly done. That's okay. We are, we are lucky in that the, the part of the, the sections of the boot process that aren't 
uh, that are proprietary are, are effectively firmware from our point of view. Like, and we gather uh, it when you do the installation. We don't actually have to ship any of yeah. that. Yeah, like I, I guess it depends on your definition here. Like if you, you will never have a system that is entirely free of blobs of all kinds, because like, you will need to use macOS as the bootloader effectively. And um, no, but what you could do is you could have the installer just prep the bare bones UEFI environment no, and we, then boot we, Anaconda we, in it. We could have the installer the on Anaconda. the Fedora side. That's what you just did. Yeah, yeah, but you still need to run it from macOS because you need to oh, yeah, yeah. from You still need to bootstrap from macOS because um, macOS is what you set the security policy from to boot another yeah. operating system. Um, I suppose once we get the secure element working, theoretically we could do installs from recovery OS so you wouldn't need macOS in theory. Uh, however, the way these machines work, um, they do need to call home at least once in their lifetime. Like if you buy a MacBook from the store and you turn, when you turn it on the first time, it has to go to the internet to talk to the mothership and check that it's not been stolen. So you, you will not be able to have a fully like air gapped install just well, by the way this system. Yeah, it's, the just, first place. it's just how these systems are designed. Yeah. Um, um, the other part of this is like from a pure Fedora point of view. Um, the main blocker, honestly, at this point, it isn't even Mesa, because Mesa's mostly integrated. Yeah, Mesa is upstream. Yeah, Mesa is mostly integrated. We just take snapshots from upstream Mesa every once in a while. But the, the thing that's actually a problem at this point is getting people in the Linux kernel community to review our patches and get them to be yeah. uh, accepted and merged and released. The reason that the patch set has gotten so big is because it's the queue is backing up. It's not like with nobody has ever been submitting them. It's just they're not getting reviewed and they're just kind of getting stuck. And well, and some of these is like the, the Rust abstractions for the GPU. Because by the way, all the GPU stuff is in Rust. And Rust in the kernel exists, but it's kind of a new thing. So it's being developed as we go. Yeah, and there's um, a bunch of people kind of afraid to look at and review any uh, Rust code, rightfully so, if they don't understand what it is. Yeah. And I think we'd get there. Yeah, and like so sa just, same for U-Boot. Like U-Boot has a bunch of patches up, I think mostly for USB support at this yeah. point. Although the um, USB support is generic, it's just you know, like yeah. someone has to, again, comes back to someone has to actually, we've submitted the patches, someone has to review them and then get them to yeah. land. Um, but yeah, once we get those, I don't see any major, major block. I think the only remaining thing we will have is unless we figure out to build macOS artifacts in Koji, we'll probably always have to ship a pre-built Python and a pre-built lib FFI for the installer. Um, but those never run actually in Linux. So like personally, I think that's probably okay. It's not the worst thing. As it's a, not the worst compromise in the world. It's not great. Have, oh yeah, we have more slides, right? Yeah. Uh, so you can find the link there for how to install it, the docs. Uh, we have an issue tracker where we track like roadmap -y things. Uh, we have a mailing list, uh, mostly used for bugs. Uh, we have a discourse. Uh, That's the upstream forum. category. Yeah. We have a discourse forum and we have a matrix room. Uh, if you like the project and you would like to throw some money at it, uh, Hector Martin, who is the main upstream developer, is on GitHub sponsors. Neil is on GitHub sponsors. Yeah, and uh, this is how we're, you know, the, this is the sponsors. The, this, the sponsorships help us buy very expensive computers to make them work. Yes, turns out computers cost money. Yeah. You guys got unlucky. We get the like $30 trash computers. Yeah. I, I don't know who's it, winning on either side it of It is this. what it is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, so clearly they have not kicked us out, so I assume we have the full hour at this point. Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, all of ButterFS, them, everything, all, yeah, you go. <laughs> yeah, so all of these buggers use ButterFS because uh, two things. The first is that way we can make the image super small and compressed, and then when it boots up, it can expand. And if someone wants to change the, the thing on the live system, ButterFS is the only file system upstream that lets you do online resize to shrink um, non-destructively. It is, uh, we, it do is list, we do list it, it on the page. It is in the documentation. Um. So yeah, all the variants use ButterFS, and yeah, and it, that's just that's just part of the core changes to make it easier to deliver that yeah. way. This is more like a user question, but is there a like argument or something that I can pass to make it display the other text bar option as the main one instead of a bunch of keys? Like it'll 
Uh, yes, uh, there is a config file for that, that demon called, there's a Rust demon Tiny called DFR. Tiny DFR that emulates uh, function keys on the touch bar, because otherwise the touch bar is empty, and these machines don't have the function row, so if you want to use Vim, it's kind of annoying. Is that something we can do like, as users, or is that like a build Yeah, you can do it as users, I'm, it's per user configurable. I believe, so the latest version of Tiny DFR is a config file. I believe you can just set it up. I don't remember if we... I, the, the support for this is in Fedora. I forgot if we ship the example config file or not. Um, but if you run like rpm-ql on the package, you might be able to see it. If not, check the upstream repository for this. Because um, I do remember when I package this, they have a config file example with the commented options. Yeah. Yeah, so it, sh it should be that one then. Yeah, yeah. and I, I believe you can change the default, change a few settings there. And upstream for that project is very responsive, so you can just ask. Yeah. Uh, um, you had a question. Uh, what is the major holdup on the Thunderbolt support? Uh, the major. Yeah. I mean, for what it's worth, uh, so the question is, what's the major holdup for Thunderbolt and USB four? It's the same. Uh, like, and I, you know, like you, it's the only reason I don't daily drive or travel around with it because I need it to work. Uh, oh, so why we're that. not presenting with that machine? Right. It's why we're not <laughs> presenting with one. We would love to be presenting with it. We can't. Um, the major holdup is that the guy that is working on it has to have time to sit down and do all the reverse engineering yeah. work. Um, it's, it's a time thing. It's not like it, has, it isn't being done. It's been slowly being worked on. My understanding is that there's go, the person who's been working on it, Sven, I believe, is... Uh, Sven and Jan. Yeah, they're Sven and Jan. They're, they're starting to, for lack of a better phrase, sprint to yeah. implement this really soon. Th so. there, there has been progress. It's just getting this to the point where it's shippable in a way that we're comfortable with users using it and it not blowing up in their face. It just takes a while. Um, the, other, the other thing I would say is when you have things like DisplayPort in the mix that are fairly complex that can fail in very non-obvious ways, you really want to have some kind of automated CI. Uh, and doing CI for things that have displays attached is entertaining. Um, so Hector Martin has been looking at building um, an environment where we can look at what these machines are outputting and we can feed them signals and we can look at, make sure that they keep behaving the way they're supposed to behave in an automated fashion so we can spark regressions early. And this is being built, it just takes a while. Yeah, and the um, other uh, side of this is that uh, we've been talking to a few folks about getting uh, a way to run OpenQA to validate this platform as well. And that's a whole other ball of special that we have not yet figured out, but it is something that we are looking yeah. toward. Any other questions? Yes. Work gifted me a MacBook Pro with an M3 chip, and I've been sitting staring at this thing for months. Is there any progress update on M3 support? Uh, no, none not of for us. Now. None of us. So to put it to put it bluntly, none of us actually have an M3 platform device to test and develop on. There are no M3 minis, and I think that's the real blocker is that there's no affordable so M3 device. Th so there's a few issues with M3. One is that uh, the mini is kind of the the gold standard for platform bring up, and it's also the, the good one to do use for doing CI and testing, because they're small, they don't take that much power, they're, they're cheap. Um, the other thing with M3 is that M3 is um, not that much better, I would say. Like, it, it is... It, it is, I would say, it is sort of difficult to justify from a project standpoint investing massive amounts of resources on M3 versus investing those resources into completing the items missing for the hardware support for M1 and M2 at this stage. So I think it's a bit of a prioritization problem as well. Keeping in mind this is still a less than 10 people operation. <laughs> and I would say most of the folks doing hardware enabled with reverse engineering is like, what, four people? Yeah. Well, so and, it, and again, it also comes down to, like, we still have to buy all these buggers. Yeah. Like, um, we, we don't have the Mac Pro supported because the starting price um, is 10 grand. That said, there, there is no known limitation that prevents M3 support to work. There is basic M3 support in the bootloader. Uh, somebody was looking at it here and there. It is totally doable. It's just a matter of putting the work in it. Yeah, I, we, we will have to see. <laughs> I mean, realistically, the, 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 the easiest way for us to be able to test to validate these new, to develop and, and enable support for these platforms is when Apple releases that platform on a Mac Mini because we have apparatuses and things for being able to 
just quickly iterate through when it's on a Mac Mini. When it's not on a Mac Mini, things are a little bit more difficult, and also they're more expensive, so we can't buy as many of them. But also, the, it's worth noting, these aren't wholly different systems. Like right. Most of the IP blocks are the same through M1. I don't know about M4, but like from 1, M2, M3, most of the IP blocks are roughly the same. So it's you can expect like 80-ish percent, let's say, throwing a random number out there, but like to be there, it's just everything else, and then getting it to the point, not just that it boosts, but that the quality level is enough that we can actually ship this to users, and users won't have a terrible experience. Yes? So these aren't vulnerabilities. This is uh, by no, design. Th there is no official support from Apple, and Apple doesn't acknowledge that the project exists effectively. The, but on the flip side of it, Apple has deliberately documented and enhanced the base platform capabilities for supporting alternate operating systems without well, talking about us. The mechanics that we use for these are the same mechanics that are required if you are a macOS kernel developer or a developer of a kernel extensions for macOS. Or if you're a hardware tester trying to support hardware new hardware. Because we use the same facility that is used to have multiple installs of macOS on the machine uh, so that you can then debug kernel uh, level things on an extension. Because what we do is with that stub macOS install, we put the security level in such a way that we can replace the kernel. And that's the same thing you would do if you were to like attach a debugger so you can check if your text is making it die or something. And like that's kind of something that I need. So the <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Uh, um, unless they want to make their own lives difficult. But this is a choice, to be clear. Like if you buy an iPad, uh, iPads have the same SOC, well, same, same -ish SOC. Ish. iPads ship with a locked bootloader. You can't do this on an iPad. Um, so it is a choice they made. Yeah, it, it is. I agree. Yeah. A lot of it does. So Hopefully. Yeah, so uh, the question is, is any of this benefiting the other ARM platforms? So the biggest one is that the USB subsystem rewrite that happened for U-Boot, because the USB code in U-Boot was really bad, uh, and it caused a lot of problems, and a lot of it was bringing it up to snuff and in conformance. That was, that's one aspect that benefited everybody who, who sadly has to use U-Boot to boot their systems. Um, a little bit from the U-Boot on Raspberry Pi. Uh, well, uh, I think the Pi still use a fork. Is the Pi stuff mainline in U-Boot now? I, I don't know. It is, it is mainline. Is it? Yeah. yeah. I know that with Pi's you also now have the other firmware you can run, which is yeah. the, just the FI. So I, I'm, I'm not sure, to be honest. But in general, I would say there's a... There's a lot of paper cuts that we found throughout this, and like where things were like good enough but not quite. And they were like I remember Hector talked about there were bugs in the USB stack on the Linux side as well, where like sometimes device just magically disappear, and and it was like, timing errors and, and stuff like that. And it was like just that. a bug that nobody hit. Well, people surely hit it before, but nobody went through debugging it and fixing it. And like there's been a bunch of things like that that end up benefiting everyone. Um, also, not specific to ARM, but like the audio stuff we talked about before, hopefully can be useful everywhere else. Uh, I mean, I suppose the touch bar daemon can be useful if you happen to have another machine with a tiny display, but that's... Uh, um, another yeah. example of this is actually the Broadcom Wi-Fi driver and oh the, God, blu yes, and the Bluetooth stuff. stack, right? So the, the Broadcom Bluetooth and Wi-Fi stuff, the driver code for that is shared with the Raspberry Pi scores of x86 computers that are unfortunate enough to have Broadcom hardware in them as well as all Macs produced all the way back to 2007. And because of that, the driver is common across all of them. Any improvements that we've made and managed to get mainlined actually benefit everyone in that respect. So like most of the, the way that Linux infrastructure works for hardware enablement is that it, it's based on commonality rather than speciality. Uh -huh. And this is where things kind of get screwy when the platform is somewhere completely different like power management. Yeah, the Broadcom example is also interesting because if you look at the upstream driver for this, which is what we run, um, let's just say its stewardship has not been the best over the years. Uh, there is another driver that Broadcom maintains, which is out of three, um, uh, which is not useful for our purposes. Uh, it's also not useful for the kernel purposes in general. So a lot of the work has been finding bugs into the in trade driver, figuring out, wait, are these actual hardware bugs? Is the driver just broken? Did we forget that, oh, no, WPA doesn't work like that? Uh, I, there's been a lot of things like that, and 
I feel like Wi-Fi on this platform works very well, uh, better than on other platforms I have seen. Um, I would still probably pick another Wi-Fi card vendor if I had another machine, but you know, that's just personal preference. <laughs> A good, strong personal preference. Um, but yeah, but I, it, it is at the end of the day the same like Linux support thing that you end up hitting everywhere, where so, some of the some of the parts that you have on the machine have, are better supported upstream, some have better stewardship, some have better involvement from the company behind it, some have less. Some requires a lot of reverse engineering effort, some don't. It's like at the end of the day, all modern machine that it's just like Lego blocks of things from all over the place. So. In an ideal world, if all this enablement stuff and all these weird driver stuff that we've done over the years is finally in the mainline kernel, a new Mac is just a new device tree uh, binding, and then you're done. Uh, we're not there yet, and I don't think we'll be there yet for a few more years if the pace of upstreaming stays the way it is. But um, if it improves, then I don't yeah. know, we could see it sooner. I don't know. Yeah, we'll see. Anything else? Are we, oh, we still have five minutes. Well, I think we're actually on time then, because, well, in that case, thank you, everyone.